Margaret. The Christian community welcomes you with great joy. In his name I claim you for Christ our Savior by the sign of his cross. I now trace the sign of the cross on your forehead and invite your parents and godparents to do the same. Are you ready to help the parents of this child in their duty as Christian parents? We are. I guess you can call me a cradle Catholic. I was raised in the church, but after confirmation, I sort of drifted away. Especially when I got to college, there were just a lot of distractions. But I reconnected when Dave and I got married, and now that we have a baby, we really want to get him baptized. I don't really know why, except that we just should. It's a family sort of thing. I was baptized, my siblings were baptized. It's just what we do. It's a beautiful ceremony. I just have never put that much thought into what it really means. I grew up Protestant. Uh, I was baptized as an adult and uh, I became Catholic when Sarah and I got married. When I went through ICAA, we talked about baptism then, but now that the baby's here, I'm just really starting to realize that this is important stuff. I just don't get it, these couples. They don't come to Mass on Sundays, but they always come back for the baptism. There's something about this sacrament. It always brings them back. I wish I could figure out a way to keep them. What is it about baptism that brings these folks back? There must be something about their family history, memories from childhood. I think when people have kids, they want them to belong to a church, to a faith. It makes them feel good. But it's so much more than just water and a cute baby. I wish I knew how to break through this, to, to be able to show the family the beauty of the sacrament. I want to find the way to reveal to them what's really happening in baptism. I think it would be so much more beautiful if we were at a river or the beach. Is this the way they baptized in the Bible? Because if it isn't, I'm not going to do it. I remember going to my little brother's baptism, but I don't think it took. That little bonnet is so girly. He's going to look like a little girl. My grandmother would kill us if we didn't have the baby baptized. I grew up Catholic, but David comes from a Protestant tradition. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I just don't know enough to explain what baptism really means. Getting the baby baptized is very important to Sarah. I'm not opposed. I just need to hear a little bit more about it first. How do you explain baptism? People see it as a beautiful symbol. On a certain level, they get it, but they don't really understand what it means. They see that beauty but it's like they're missing something. Baptism isn't just important, it's essential. If people could just get this, if they only understood, their entire faith would change. Water is a remarkable substance. Scientists identify 21 anomalous properties, characteristics of water that aren't explained by the laws of chemistry and physics. It's almost a natural miracle in itself. 
As a liquid, it falls as rain. As vapor, it rises up and forms the clouds. Because it flows, it circulates and purifies itself, offering each generation refreshment. It flows into creeks, that flow into streams, that flow into rivers, that flow into the ocean, covering most of the earth. Water fills the oceans, and its absence defines the desert. Without water, there is no life on earth. God uses the natural to teach us about the supernatural, the visible to point us to the invisible. All the sacraments use natural created things as signs of the work of supernatural recreation God performs in those sacraments. Water, wine, oil, all of these natural things used by the church in her sacraments are first vital parts of the biblical story. Water's the source of life. No water, no life. We see this in the very beginning of scripture. There's a river that flows from the Garden of Eden bringing life. Again, in the very last chapters of the Bible, we see paradise. A fountain of living water flows from a throne of God bringing life. So as we're going through all these stories in the Bible, you're gonna start seeing how this important sign of living water is going to add up. So there's a pattern to the use of water in scripture. And if we begin to trace this pattern out, then we can begin to understand baptism. So what I wanna do is plunge into the scriptures themselves. And the way I wanna do that is by starting at the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. So in the beginning, we see the Holy Spirit sort of moving over the face of the water. And I want you to keep that image in mind because it's an image that's going to keep coming back up again and again throughout the Bible. So from the start, we see this connection between life-giving water and the Holy Spirit, who is the life giver. But remember, we have God's Spirit kind of hovering over the waters, and then there's a separation of land from water. And this land is where life now is going to be able to dwell and thrive. Most of you probably remember the story of Adam and Eve, even if it's from your childhood. So God's going to create humanity and breathe his own life into humans. And that's where the human world begins. Over and over again during his making of the world, God looks at his work and we're told he saw that it was good. But there is only one thing that doesn't make the cut. Adam is alone. God looks on Adam's loneliness and says, it is not good. So he creates the first woman to be his life's companion. Adam and Eve are together in paradise, the Garden of Eden. So there's Adam and Eve. Right? They live in perfect communion. They live in communion with God, with themselves, with the people around them, with nature. And God gives them access to everything, almost everything. There's one thing. There's this tree in the middle of the garden that God told them not to touch. They don't have access to that. And if they eat this fruit, then they'll die. And there's so much around them to delight and enjoy. All of creation is theirs. But there they are, for some reason, right next to this tree. And then along comes the serpent, right? And the scriptures tell us that the serpent is subtle, he's sly, and he challenges Eve about what God had actually says. He says, you won't die. Actually, he says it's just the opposite. If you eat the fruit, your eyes will be opened and you'll actually know good and evil and you'll be like gods. So there's Eve. She's got this decision to make. She's got the fruit in her hand and she can decide, wait a second, is God holding out on me? Is he keeping something that I ought to have? And she's got to make a decision. So she looks at it, she takes a bite, and she gives it to her husband who's right there with her. The temptation of Adam and Eve isn't simply about whether that fruit is good to eat or not, but it's about whether or not they should trust God. And that's the point that they're really struggling with. I like to point out Adam's job. He was charged with protecting Eve. If the language used to describe the serpent was something menacing, there was a real threat. 
Adam was not doing his job. So Adam and Eve eat the fruit, and their eyes are open, but it's not quite what they expected, right? It's not what the serpent promised. They're not gods. And worse than that, their humanity is damaged in a way that God never intended. They realize they're naked and they're ashamed. And I think they do what a lot of us would do under the exact same circumstances. They run and they hide. Now, one of the psalm writers says, Where can I hide from your spirit? If I go to heaven, you'll find me there. If I seek the deepest parts of the underworld, you'll be there. So God seeks out Adam and Eve, just like he seeks all of us out. And I just imagine his heartbreak, that his children, the ones who he loved, they've broken his commands. They've done precisely what he asked them not to do. They've brought death into humanity. They're estranged from him, who is their creator, the holy and immortal God. St. Paul says that we were dead in our transgressions and sins. At the moment Adam and Eve tasted the fruit, they spiritually died. What does that mean? It's like this, Adam and Eve, when they were created by God, they were filled with supernatural life, with union with him. But when they sinned, they lost that gift of union with God. It's kind of like this. If I have a glass of water here, but I, I take the water and I pour it out, there's no more water in here. And that's kind of what happened with Adam and Eve. They were created with physical life, biological life, but God intended them to also have this great supernatural life. But when they sinned, they lost it. That's the effect of what we call original sin. And it's tragic not just for Adam and Eve, it's also tragic for us. Because that great gift of supernatural life, God intended that to be passed on to all of us. But since they didn't have it, they don't have it to pass on to us. So when we enter into this world, we receive biological life, but it's as if our glass is empty. We don't have that supernatural life of union with God. But God had a plan. And so begins an amazing and mysterious love story as God has to take action to bring his beloved back to spiritual life again. This is how we read the story of salvation. We start by stepping back and looking at the big picture of all the things that God has done for us to bring us back into right relationship with him. So as we move throughout salvation history, we'll see how God reaches out to humanity again and again. And again, one of the things we see is that water plays a huge role in this. So we come to this point in the story where mankind has apparently reached this unrecoverable point of evil. There's violence, there's bloodshed, like the world had never seen before. So now what God has to do is not only deal with the wicked people who won't turn from their evil ways, but he also has to rescue this righteous man and his family from this utter depravity in the world around them. And I think you guys all know the story. It's Noah and the Ark. In here, the images of the creation story are seen again. The waters part, the land appears to create a space for the life of God's people. Noah becomes the new Adam with a fresh start. At that point, God makes a new covenant with Noah and all humanity. Included in this covenant is a promise, signified by the sign of the rainbow, that God will never destroy the world with a flood again. Unfortunately, we see in Noah the same pattern of sin as we saw in Adam. Noah builds a garden vineyard and while enjoying its fruit, he becomes drunk, naked, and ashamed. We see here that sin continues in spite of the new beginning that God has given to humanity. So the water of the flood didn't purge the sin of Adam and the human race. Something much more is needed. All right, so here's what I want to do next. I want to talk about the people that we call the patriarchs of the Old Testament, so the most important characters, right? And I want to look at the ways in which water is used in all of these stories to prefigure baptism, right? So the next major character after Noah is a man named Abraham, and God's going to form this covenant with Abraham that's going to stretch throughout the rest of the Bible all the way into the time of Jesus. Abraham has a son named Isaac, and Isaac is going to in turn have a son named Jacob, who's also called Israel. And Israel actually had a son whose name was Joseph. Am I losing you guys? All right, you're probably wondering what on earth this has to do with baptism. This is why you're here, right? You're not here for a long lecture. Okay, here's the deal. You can trace baptism through all of these stories, through the entire story of the Old Testament, through all of the patriarchs, all of the major figures, this theme of water and death and new life keeps coming out again and again. Now, there's one story you probably do remember. It's the story of the Exodus. Remember Moses. So, 
Back up, there was that guy named Joseph. He was able to actually save his whole family, all of his brothers and then their children, by bringing them up to Egypt to save them from this famine. And so the nation of Israel begins to grow within the borders of Egypt. But the new Pharaoh, who comes to power during the story, becomes threatened by this growing nation within his borders. And he becomes very threatened, and so he decides to formulate this population control. And what he does is actually kill every firstborn son. But in the midst of that, there's this one baby, there's this one male child named Moses, who's placed into this little basket of reeds, a little ark like Noah's, and he's put into the water to be saved. It looks like baptism, a baby being put into water for his salvation. The child is saved by an Egyptian princess who draws him out of the water, and she names him Moses. The story of Moses is the same as the story of Israel rescue in the midst of water. But first, Moses has to get his people out of Egypt. The Pharaoh won't allow it. He wants to keep them enslaved. So God, through Moses, sends plagues upon the Egyptians at the very river where Moses should have died as a child. Then God gives Moses a very profound and prophetic sign. He tells Moses to strike the Nile with his staff and the water turns into blood. Why blood? First, it represents the blood of the innocent children slaughtered by Egypt. But it also represents God's strength and power over the gods of Egypt, because during this time, the Nile was worshipped as a god by the Egyptian people. So by striking the Nile and making it bleed, God is showing both the Israelites and the Egyptians his mighty power. By killing their false gods, so to speak, he proves that he alone is the one true God. But Pharaoh still refuses to free the Israelites. Okay, the plagues were bad, but the final plague was gonna be the convincer. It's the one that the Israelites would forever know as the Passover. Now, here's the thing. God sends the angel of death, which sounds pretty ominous, and he sends him through the land to kill all of the firstborn Egyptian children, which is a horrifying thought, but if you think about it, this is the exact same thing that Pharaoh did to the Israelites back when Moses was born. Except now, God's gonna create this way to spare those who have the mark of the blood of a lamb on their doorposts. So we see the Jews marked the doorpost and lintel with blood. Think about it. Blood on the doorpost. That's a bold declaration. That's an in-your-face sign. But what's fascinating is that this foreshadows something that we're probably all familiar with. A sign God is asking us to do to boldly mark that we're set apart left to right, top to bottom. Does it look familiar? In blood, we have the sign of the cross. So the Pharaoh finally yields, and Moses is finally able to lead the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But here's the thing, as they reach the Red Sea, they're horrified to find out that Pharaoh has actually changed his mind, and he's right behind them, and he's coming with an army who's bent on revenge. So remember the story. Moses prays and the waters part and the dry land appears before them. The whole nation walks on dry ground between those walls of water and they see God's spirit in the pillar of cloud and fire, which actually we'll see a connection to in the right. The pillar of cloud and fire leads them to the other side and to freedom. Pharaoh and his army go chasing after, but they sink into the mud and the waters are unleashed upon them. Israel is saved through the waters of the Red Sea. The Bible and our Catholic Catechism tell us that this crossing is a type of baptism. Type is a word that theologians use to describe a person, place, or thing in the Old Testament that is a kind of prefigurement, a prophecy fulfilled in Christ in the New Testament. So the Catechism tells us, quote, literally, the liberation of Israel from the slavery of Egypt announces the liberation wrought by baptism. After their escape from the sea, God leads the Israelites through the wilderness to Mount Sinai, where he reveals himself to them in lightning and thunderclaps. There he teaches them the law and promises that his presence will go with them. The Israelites are set free from Egypt, are taught by God himself at the mountain, and travel to the land he promised them. The story of their deliverance from Egypt will define who they are forever, God's people. God has become their redeemer. They've been brought from the slavery of death to new life. 
They were protected by a seal and led by the Spirit. We're marked, we're sealed, we're set apart. Just like that sign on the doorpost, we put this sign on ourselves and on our families to set them apart. God gave us all these images and events in the history of Israel to tell us something about our own baptisms. Whether it's Noah in the ark or Moses in the basket or Israel crossing the Red Sea or the sacrifice of the Passover lamb, all these stories involve a certain dying and a new life, a leaving behind and a entering into something new. It's so beautiful that God gave us these as foreshadowings to tell us about the ultimate dying and rising he wants us to experience in baptism. In the waters of baptism, we die to ourselves. We leave behind the way of sin and we're filled with new life and begin a new way of following Christ. So I want to fast forward across the centuries to the time when the nation of Israel finally dwelt in what was called the promised land. Now, one of the things we've begun to see is that Israel is really a nation with all sorts of ups and downs with God, obeying him, disobeying him, worshiping other gods, going after other nations, political alliances, you name it, all sorts of things. So they're conquered and they're taken again as slaves into another foreign nation, just like Egypt. They're separated from the promised land. But there's a prophet that God raises up named Ezekiel, who God sends as a messenger and promises the people that they will come back eventually to their land once again. But this time the Exodus is not gonna be marked with the crossing of a Red Sea, but it'll be kind of a similar watershed moment. Listen to what God says through the prophet Ezekiel. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. The prophet Jeremiah gives us the same promise. So what we're seeing here is that it's God's intention it's his deepest desire to make us clean, to free us from sin, and to bring us back into right relationship with him. This is really what God truly wants. So here's the thing. Even though Israel has sort of given up on God, God will not give up on them. And that's what we find out when the story continues. And guess what? Water plays a part. You know, there's no better place to reflect on the life of John the Baptist than at a river, because John spent the focus of his prophetic mission at the Jordan River. The only thing more odd than John's apparel was the place he addressed Israel from. Why would John ask Israel to leave the cities, even the holy city of Jerusalem, to come down to the wilderness and to the muddy waters of the Jordan River? This is the question that will unveil the meaning of John's work because the Jordan River is more than just a water that offers physical cleansing. No, John wanted Israel to go through a deeper spiritual cleansing. And every Jew knew that the waters of the Jordan meant more than physical water. It was waters with a history, a sacred history. Jewish people came out of the cities to the wilderness to hear John, to repent of their sins and to be baptized. John immersed each one of them in the Jordan River. No one seemed to question the practice of baptism. In fact, the crowds would have been familiar with ritual baths, which cleansed both body and soul for the worship of God. So they came, and among them was John's cousin, Jesus. A lot of people wonder, uh, as they read through the Gospels, or they hear the, the, the Gospels proclaimed, why did Jesus need to be baptized? Well, there's two reasons. First. He establishes the pattern as a member of the human race that all humanity is meant to follow. Uh, those who are baptized are baptized into his death and resurrection. Secondly, and quite beautifully, and we pray this in Masses for John the Baptist, there's a line in the preface, the priest prays, to make holy the flowing waters, he, John the Baptist, baptized the very author of baptism. So it's not Jesus who's washed clean from sin, but the waters which themselves are purified. And of course, that water has come down to us through history and his power, his innocence, his grace is made present wherever any child anywhere is baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
You know, most people don't know that Leonardo da Vinci's very first painting was of John the Baptist baptizing Jesus in the Jordan River. He was a young pupil of Andrea del Verrocchio, the greatest artist probably of that time. They painted this painting together, and Andre would put down his brush after he saw his young pupil, Leonardo, complete the John the Baptist. Andre said he would never paint again because his young pupil had outclassed him and outshone him so much. And as you look at that painting, you'll see a Jesus in the center that's robust and healthy and vigorous. And you'll see a John the Baptist standing next to him who's skin and bones from his fasting and asceticism. You see a John who looks haggard and weak. That physical portrait and contrast signifies the strength of what Jesus wants to give and the weakness of where Israel is spiritually. Now at the Jordan River, God acts again. Jesus, who is the God who created water, gathered Noah's family into the ark, directed Moses and Joshua to lead his people through the water, now sanctifies, makes sacred the waters of baptism, making that water capable of performing a new creation, gathering us into a new ark, making possible a new exodus and a new entry into the promised land. All this is announced by John's words, Behold the Lamb of God. As John stands in the water next to Jesus, he's holding a banner, a pole. And on that banner, you can read in Latin the words Agnus Dei, which means the Lamb of God, a key title that John the Baptist will give to Jesus at this moment of Jesus' baptism. The Lamb imagery is rooted in the Exodus story, when the people of Israel were saved by the blood of the Passover Lamb. How did we get to this point in the story? What made John say, Behold the Lamb of God. How did he know that something great, something different was happening at this baptism? John the Baptist isn't an ordinary man. He's given an extraordinary gift from God. He's a great prophet. In fact, the Bible tells us that when he was in his mother's womb, he leapt in Elizabeth's womb at the presence of Jesus Christ. And his own mother was filled with the Holy Spirit. So this shows us that he has prophetic insight. And so when he sees Jesus here at the Jordan River, he knows that Jesus isn't just another Jewish man, but that Jesus is the great Messiah, the Savior, the chosen chosen one, the Lamb of God, who would take away the sins of the world. Notice that Leonardo doesn't give Jesus a simple halo, but rather he puts in Jesus' halo the figure of the cross, wanting to link Jesus' baptism with Jesus' crucifixion. It's a foreshadowing that as Jesus is giving himself in the waters of the Jordan, he will also give himself on the cross to die for us, to empower baptism with the saving grace of his redemption. So baptism and cross linked tightly together. This connection may seem rather odd at first, but Jesus himself makes the connection between his crucifixion and baptism. On the way to Jerusalem, Two of his disciples, James and John, asked to have seats of honor at his right and left hand in his coming kingdom. He says flatly, you don't know what you're asking, and then asks, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Surely Jesus isn't talking about the baptism he received from John. So what is he talking about? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? As Christ was raised from the dead, we too might walk in newness of life. Here, St. Paul is showing something beautiful about the sacrament of baptism. Baptism enables us to enter into Jesus' own death and burial. Just as being immersed into water is often associated with death by drowning, as in the people who were drowned during Noah's flood or the Egyptians who were drowned while chasing the Israelites across the Red Sea, so too immersion into the baptismal waters signifies and affects a ritual dying in Jesus Christ. We participate in the death of Jesus on the cross. And likewise, when we come out of the waters of baptism, that signifies Jesus coming out of the tomb in the new life of the resurrection. Okay, we have to wonder, how many different ways does God have to show us? What will it take for us to understand? The fact is, 
We're called to die to sin and rise to new life in the grace of Christ. That's what the Christian life is all about, and baptism is the start of it all. The baptism of Jesus, the start of his earthly ministry, is actually the culmination of the story of water in salvation history that started with the creation of the world from water. As it flows through the story, the sign of water gathers meaning around itself. From a sign of creation, it becomes a sign of recreation in Noah, salvation from slavery in the Exodus, and entry into the promised land under Joshua. From all eternity, God had arranged these events in such a way that when Jesus arrived at the Jordan River, everything that God had done in the Old Covenant story reaches fulfillment and completion in Christ. And all the great works of God in history now come to have their effect upon us in the sacrament of baptism, an essential part of God's plan for us. Think about what's going to happen when your child is baptized, when the priest pours the water and says those words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. At that sacred moment, your child will be changed. Several amazing things happen at baptism. First, when someone's baptized, they're freed from any personal sins they may have committed. But secondly, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And think about what that means, that baptism, your child is gonna be filled with God's life. He or she's gonna become a son or daughter of God now. Thirdly, your child is going to be incorporated into the church. And what that means is your child is gonna have a much larger family. They're gonna join the supernatural family of God and have the brothers and sisters of all the Christians that have been baptized, both here on earth, and they're gonna be united with all the saints in heaven. And finally, your child is going to begin to share in the church's mission of bringing Christ's love, his truth, his goodness out into the world around us. We have to remember, this rite, this sacrament, like all sacraments, is a visible action with an invisible power. If we think of the words and actions of the sacraments simply as quaint ways of remembering past events, we're entirely missing the point. Baptism has huge effects for us because the sacramental actions are words and deeds of divine power just as were the great events of salvation history. And in fact, what God accomplished in those events, he accomplishes again in what we call the effects or graces of baptism. The water that flows over us in baptism accomplishes the same things in us that it did in the Old Testament story, makes of us new creations in Christ bears us up over the destructive power of sin in the new ark that we call the church. Salvation from the slavery of sin, as in the Exodus, and entry into the promised land, which is heaven. <laughs> 